Okay, good afternoon. So, um, so I'm, as you already know, I'm Götze, Lothar Götze. And uh, I'm uh, giving you the course in algebra. So my room is 110. And um, one of our postdocs, uh, who's called uh, uh, Tarek Abdel Gadir, I'm not sure, um, so he said uh, that he, if uh, his room is uh, 122, so if you have questions that you do not want to ask to me or whatever, or anyway, if you just have, you can also talk to him. He would like also to. Uh, see you anyway. I'm usually in my room. Whenever you uh, have questions about what I say, you can come either to me or to him. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so the topic is uh, of this course is algebra, and we will be we'll somehow have three parts. We'll be dealing with uh, groups, uh, rings and fields, and in the case of the fields, we'll do Galois theory also. Um, <clears throat> so this course essentially starts from zero. So I mean, we start with the definition of a group. So it's um, quite elementary. Maybe for some of you, it will be boring. I mean, if it's really boring for everybody, we can try kind of change it. But on the other hand, uh, if it's only boring to, for some of you and some others actually uh, are learning something, we uh, keep it the way it is. <clears throat> and so I will just start by the definition of a group. If you have any problems, if I'm going too fast or you don't understand something, you tell me. If you cannot read my handwriting, you also tell me, but I can not permanently improve it. You know, you will also have to learn to, uh, to read it. <clears throat> okay, so let's start. So what is a group? Uh, by the way, you have my notes. No, I have prepared some notes. Um, I will actually be following the notes very closely. I've just prepared them before starting this course. Um, they are so new that they are also still full of misprints, as you will have maybe noticed. Um, and, but you know, anyway, I will. Uh, I hopefully will say the correct things in the lecture. So, so a group. Uh, will be a, is a set will be with a binary operation so somehow you can multiply two elements a b you can multiply them and get an element a times b So, um, so somehow, you know, you, so it's somehow a set in which you can multiply the elements and some obvious actions should hold. There should be the associative law, so it doesn't play a role how you put brackets for this operation, and you have a neutral element, and, uh, uh, and every element has an inverse. So let me write this down properly. So definition. So, so we take a non-empty set set G with a binomial operation so this is multiplication from G times G to G which sends a pair of elements A, B to something which we want to call A times B. So just, you know, binary operation just means that for two elements we get one element. <coughs> uh, is called a group. If the following axioms are true,
Well, first we have the associative law. So we can, so in, it's written like this. So if you have A times B, so for this is always for all A, B, C elements in G. If we take A times B and we multiply this by C, this is the same as if we multiply B with C and on the other side multiply it by A. So this just means you know, we have this operation. So A times, so we can, it just means we first do this operation. We multiply them, get an element of G, we multiply with this, and then we do this. With, with the binary operation. I mean, yeah, this you, it is in principle, so binary is what, with a binary operation. So I will try to maybe write bigger. Um, so this is the first thing. And I mean, you know, <coughs> Uh, it's kind of a standard thing for any kind of operation that you need this associativity is the first thing that you always require. Second one, we have a neutral element. So that means uh, there exists an element E in G such that uh, we have that E times A is equal to A times E is equal to A for all A and G. So it's an, an element for which the multiplication with it doesn't do anything. And the last one is that every element has an inverse, so that if you multiply the element by the inverse, you get the neutral element. So, so <coughs> for every element for all A in G, we have an element a to the minus 1 in G, such that a times a to the minus 1 is equal to a to the minus 1 times a is equal to e. OK, so these are these simple axioms. <coughs> and it somehow captures some part of uh, what we are used to if we kind of multiply elements in z or in in the, comp in the complex numbers, the real numbers, or the rational numbers, or if we add integers. Um, and, uh, okay. <clears throat> so, so we will, we can make, we can, by this definition, we can simplify slightly the notations. For instance, uh, you know, as the bracketing doesn't play any role, we can also forget the brackets. So we write, uh, also ABC for, so first we write AB for A times B. So we usually will kind of suppress the operation. And we can also write ABC for uh, ABC, which is the same as ABC. No, after all, it doesn't play a role. <coughs> it's well defined. So we will start, now I want to, you know, as an exercise in these definitions, which are kind of straightforward definitions, <coughs> to, uh, you know, just abstractly use the definitions, we want to prove some elementary properties of groups. But really elementary. <laughs> so this should uh, seem completely trivial to you. So we have a remark. Let's say first, uh, the neutral element is unique. So as I said, this is not really, these are not particularly great results. But the, the point is that we have here our actions, and we want to argue only the actions. And you have to uh, get familiar with these abstract arguments if you are not already. So let E and E prime be neutral elements. So that means if I multiply anything by E, I get back the other thing I multiply by. So we have this property. So 
then, well, we can say E is equal to E times E prime, because after all, E prime is also a neutral element. And this is equal to E prime, because E is a neutral element. So, and so is equal to E prime. OK, so the neutral element is unique. Any two neutral elements are equal. Um, then, uh, so this was the first one. Second one is, uh, so the inverse is unique. That's somehow similar. So, <coughs> so let B and P prime be inverses of, of A. A an element in G. Well, so I can write B prime, say, I want it, yeah, is B times A, E. E is our neutral element. So this is B prime times AB, because B is inverse to A. And this is equal to B prime. Got it? So this was like this. Now we can use the associativity. So this B prime A times B. This is EB equal to B. OK, so it's uh, really straightforward. Then uh, we've just used the axioms. The third statement would be, so it's enough to be an inverse. Actually, it's also true for a neutral element. It's enough to be that one of these two identities holds, so that it is a left inverse, say, or a left uh, identity. But now we just say it for identities. So, um, let B in G be an element uh, with um, B times A is equal to the identity element, then it is the inverse. Well, this one can do in different ways. But I can also just, uh, I mean, I would just write like this. If I take the inverse, so I, you know, I'm actually, then I can write this as e times a to the minus 1. Um, <clears throat> and e I can write as b a. And as uh, a is the inverse, this is uh, PE equal to B. OK, so these are all very simple things. And then maybe I don't do the other ones, which are of similar, I mean, well, they are even simpler. Uh, so maybe the fourth one is that uh, if I take the inverse of A to the minus 1, this is A. Uh, well, so this is actually almost tautological. We know that a times a to the minus 1 is, e is equal to a to the minus 1 times a equal to e, which says precisely that a is the inverse of a to the minus 1. And then finally, I mean, as one uses it often, if I take the inverse of a product, this is the product of the inverses, but the other way around. Well, and that's in some sense clear. If I take A, B times B to the minus 1, A to the minus 1, then this is, you know, A. B, B to the minus 1, A to the minus 1. So I first can cancel these. This is A, A to the minus 1, and this is E. So they are inverse to each other. Obviously, OK. So much for that. <coughs> so this was very simple. So there's another 
property which is also useful, which uh, is sometimes called the cancellation property. So that is, um, if I have an identity in group, so let again A, B, C be elements in G, and assume that uh, A, B is equal to A, C, then it follows. So if, then it follows that B is equal to C. So you can always cancel equal factors. And uh, in the same way, if um, B A is equal to C A, then it also follows that B is equal to C. And this is obvious. You just multiply with the inverse of A on both sides. Here you multiply with A to the minus 1. On this side, you get B equal to C. So if I take A to the minus 1, A B, then you know, before they were equal, now I multiply. This will be equal to A to the minus 1. AC, and I can forget the brackets as usual, and then this is E, so this is equal to B, and this is equal to C, and the same way for the other equation. So there's a <coughs> another property that we are very used to with the groups that we know is that many groups are commutative, so it doesn't play a role in which order the elements are when we multiply them. This is true for the integers, this is true for the rational numbers, and so on. So I will, as although you all, will, all know it, I will still kind of write it down. So definition. <coughs> a group G, G is called commutative. If, uh, well, if, uh, if I take A times B is equal to B times A uh, for all A and B in G. And I want to also introduce notation for that. So the kind of standard, uh, it is, most of the time, when you have a commutative group, not always, but most of the time, you uh, write it in additive notation. So you write plus in term, term instead of uh, times. And so, so often for commutative groups, so write uh, the operation as plus. So um, this then says we write, uh, so we write A plus B instead of A times B. And uh, we write minus A instead of A to the minus 1. And we can write A minus B instead of um, A times B to the minus 1. And we write 0 for the neutral element. So this is uh, most of the time when we have a commutative group, we will do that, but not always. So now I want to give a few examples, which you uh, essentially all know to see that uh, groups are all over the place. <coughs> and uh, so the first example, I mean, anyway, first, are there any questions until now? I mean, until now I've just written here these uh, definitions and have some simple computations. So if there's anything which is not clear at this point, you should really tell me, because then I have to change my, uh, uh, my approach. 
But if, uh, if it, it should feel kind of trivial to you, but you know, you shouldn't be extremely super bored, but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> okay. Any comments? No. <laughs> okay. So can you f now essentially read what I write, or is it very difficult? It's okay. All the operations we deal with is application on addition. What? The operations we define here. Multiplication and addition. No, no. What? I, what? The operations we define by we define the group is a non empty set with the binary operation. Yes. The binary operation is only addition and multiplication. I mean, well, I mean, what does it mean? We, we have a binary operation which have, satisfies certain properties, and then we call, we denote it either by times or by plus. But, you know, it's not, you know, you can obviously, even on the integers, you can, could define a binary operation which has nothing to do with the addition or the multiplication. You know, it's just that we call it like that. We call, in this case, we call it sum, but it doesn't have to mean the sum. You know, it's just uh, is the notation that we put. I will give some examples, although in that case it actually is the sum. <laughs> anyway, so we first we give some examples. So we first can take, for instance, uh, the first example is the trivial group. So a group should be a non-empty set. So in particular, it, uh, the smallest non-empty set consists of one element. We could, for instance, take the element which consists of an element which we call 1 or E. So, and uh, this becomes a group by defining that E times E is defined to be equal to E. And then you can check that this is a group. Obviously, E is the neutral element, and it's also its own inverse. OK, and uh, so this is kind of a the most stupid example of a group. So we can take, for instance, the integer set. And uh, with the usual ad addition. Z plus, so really, an integer is an integer, and you just add them the usual way. This will be an abelian group. Everybody knows that uh, it is, uh, you know, that this is the case. That you can add integers, and the order in which you add them doesn't play a role. <coughs> then, on the other hand, for instance, if we take uh, z together with the multiplication, this is not a group. So again, we take the standard multiplication on the integers. It's not a group because not every element has an inverse. For instance, 2 has no. So the, you find that the neutral, uh, so new, it has a neutral element. Obviously, is 1. But, and, but uh, the inverse, so 2, for instance, has no inverse. Actually, that was even a bit worse. I take maybe z without 0. It's not a group. Otherwise, it's even <laughs> more wrong. Um, I mean, also z without, also z obviously is not a group. But in that case, you have, this isn't, you don't even have a neutral element. So then uh, uh, maybe we forget about this. So uh, let me have a slightly more complicated example. So let k be some integer, say a positive integer. So by this I mean that uh, so I want to define a group uh, structure on the set of all integers from 0 to k. So let me write, although this is not standard, let, uh, so I just write zk 
for the set of the elements 0, 1, until k minus 1. So it's, it's set with k elements. And we want to make this into a group. And in, in different guises, this will, we will kind of encounter this many times. So I do it like this. So if we have an, if we have an integer, so if n in z is an integer, I denote integer. I denote um, by, I mean, that's maybe not standard anyway, but I say it. And underlined the rest of division by k. So, so the rest of dividing uh, n by k. So that is, we write um, uh, n n equal to d times k plus n bar, where d is an integer, and n is an element you know, of this set. And you learn in uh, high school that you can always do this, and this is the rest of this division. So um, now we want to make this. So and then we define a group structure. So we define an addition on the set, so an operation, which we call addition on zk, which I denote a slightly different way, so I say maybe plus. So I say n. So if you have two elements here, n, which are elements of, of zk, so, so these are numbers from 0 to k minus 1, I can add them, I say, and I denote the addition like this. This is done by taking the usual sum as integers. and then taking the rest under division by k. So if I have, you have two numbers which lie between 0 and k minus 1, if I take the sum, it doesn't necessarily be try, lie between 0 and k minus 1, but I can, if it's too large, I can subtract k from it, and I get an integer in the here, and this I define to be the sum. And I claim this is an abelian group. This makes this thing into an abelian group. So ZK with this operation plus is an abelian group. Well, this is kind of trivial. So we have to check the action. So we, for instance, about the associativity. So what we have to prove is that if we take such a uh, triple sum m plus n plus l where these are elements in zk this is the same as doing it the other round we have just to look at the definition so this is we take n plus m the usual sum and the rest under division by k and then we sum this so maybe for the moment I write plus l which is by definition n plus m plus k, plus l. And so, you know, but this just means we, you know, we sum these elements and we subtract the corresponding multiple of k until we get uh, in the element zk. So this is just the same as the sum of all three, the rest, under division by k. 
And this now is symmetric. So if we can kind of perform this operation backwards, this is equal to n plus m plus l equal to, well, that's what I wanted. I mean, you just make these steps on the other side backwards, and you get this. Because this is already complete symmetric. And you know that in the, so this would be first, if you write like this, it would be first like this. But you know the associativity holds in Z, so you can also, so maybe you can write it like this, like this. And this is equal to N plus M plus L. Because here we are in the integers, and the integers, the addition is addi additive, and then you go backwards and you get N plus M plus L. And um, the commutativity is also clear, you know, you know that uh, if you take the sum n plus m, this is n plus m, the rest of this, but the addition in the integers is commutative, so this is m plus n. <coughs> and uh, obviously, the neutral element for this addition is the element 0, because if we add 0 to ele element in Z, you get back the same element. It doesn't change when we take the rest under division by K. And um, the inverse of some element L to K minus 1 is OK. If L is equal to 0, we take um, uh, uh, take zero, so and uh, if L and otherwise we take the inverse of uh, another L which is different from zero, otherwise. Uh, the inverse of L is uh, K minus L. Because if we take uh, L plus K minus L, then obviously this is uh, the rest under division by K of L plus K minus L, which is K the rest under division by k of k, which is 0. OK, so this is a kind of it's a very simple example. But somehow, we have, uh, you will see that this can be viewed as an example of taking a, a quotient group of a group by a normal subgroup. And, um, we will, in the moment, we don't. Uh, uh, need that to know that. So another, yeah, I give one more example. If I, so a bit more abstract, which you know from linear algebra. So let, I uh, don't know which number I'm now at, but anyway, five. Uh, let uh, V be a vector space. Then I can call, say, the, maybe the group of automorphisms of V is a set of all, uh, say, phi from V to V, where V is a linear map. So a vector space, say, well, an R vector space or something, doesn't matter. V is a linear map. So phi is linear, and phi is bijective. So then these form a group. So out of V is a group. What? Yeah, well, I can take any vector, any field, but you know, whatever. I, I could say the field, say V is an R vector space, and then this would be R linear. But you know, whatever, no? Any field. So out of V is a group. 
Well, you know, you know that uh, so the the group operation is the composition of maps. So I can say that uh, so phi times psi would be phi composed with psi. I know they are both bijective maps. I can compose them, and I get another bijective linear map. And uh, so, so we know it's a standard fact that one uh, learns uh, uh, early in the one's life that the uh, composition of map is always associative. So this is associative. Follows from the definition just by remembering what it means to compose map, and uh, we see that if um, so, the, if I take the uh, the identity of v from v to v, which sends any vector to itself, is uh, the neutral element. Because if I compose with the identity, I get back the same map. And um, you know, <coughs> if uh, phi is an automorphism of V, it is a bijective map, so it has a bijective linear map, so it has a bijective linear inverse. So we have phi to the minus one be the inverse map. And then it is also the inverse in the group. So phi to the minus 1 is the inverse element. In out of v. Because by definition, to be the inverse map precisely means that uh, both compositions of phi and phi to the minus 1 are the identity. You know, phi composed with phi to the minus 1 is equal to phi to the minus 1 composed with phi is equal to the identity of phi. That's what it means to be the inverse map. And that's the same definition as what it means to be the inverse element in the group. OK. A similar thing that we can look at is just <coughs> you know, the symmetric group on a set, which is, a, in some sense, a more general statement so if um, so 6 let m be any set we can just call so the group s of m is just defined to be the set uh, of permutations of M is just a set of all bijections of M to itself. And uh, by the same token as before, uh, I mean, the same argument will actually see that this is a group by composition so that means uh, no. so again phi times psi is equal to phi composed is psi, and the composition of bijective maps is the bijective maps. And we have, again, the identity of M is a neutral element. And the inverse map to a given bijection is the inverse element.
Okay, so this is, um, I mean, somehow, okay. So we have many groups. This is not, <coughs> so um, traditionally, when groups were introduced, they were always viewed as groups of permutations of some set. So they were always thought of being that. That's how groups were first uh, considered. I mean, this was what the group was supposed to be. And uh, so in that sense, uh, this uh, kind of goes back to the standard things. <coughs> and actually, uh, this comes up also in the context of Galois theory, which we will do at the very end of our course. And in fact, groups were invented to do Galois theory, which is, you know, somehow. Um, anyway, so we have here. So we look at a special case of this when we have a kind of very simple set. So if M, we can look at the symmetric group on just the set of elements 1 to N. So on this finite man is called the symmetric group of order n, and I will usually denote it, I think, by, I don't know what my notation is. Maybe I will just call it Sn. Okay? Usually we have some kind of Gothic S or something, but uh, as I cannot write that, I write it like this, Sn. This is, uh, so it's a special case of this where the set M, of which we take the permutations, so all the bijective maps to itself is a finite set, 1 to n. And um, here one can be very explicit. So again, the, uh, the group operation is just a composition like this. And um, we want to make some computations in this. So what, yes? Yeah, OK. Mm. No, it has nothing to do with the order of the group. Actually, the group order of the group is much bigger. Actually, I'm slightly wondering whether I want to call it the symmetric group of order n after your comment. Um, so maybe one could also uh, say um, the symmetric group Sometimes I, have, I would call it symmetric group in N, on n letters. So somehow you have n letters and you permute them. Maybe that's a better, better name. Okay. <coughs> so, so we introduce the following notation for such a permutation. So if I have an element, so for you write an element f, from, uh, so after all, in Sn, so it's a bijection from the set 1n to itself. Um, in Sn, we write this as, so we write first all the elements 1 to n, 1, 2, 3, and so on until n, and below we write their image. So f of 1, f of 2, f of n. Okay, so we have some notation how to write this thing. <coughs> Later we will also find other notations. So let's look at, uh, so we can look at uh, some examples. For instance, S2, um, you know, all the bijections from the set 1, 2 to itself, there are not very many. There's it consists just of two elements. There's either the identity element, so the identity uh, element, which is just uh, so consists on consists of well, so the identity, which I, in this notation would be one, two, one, two, and uh, there's only one more element, which is permuting the two, so. Um, 1, 2, 2, 1. So this has two elements. We can also look at S3. Um, again, we 
start with the identity element. So, so every element goes to itself. And then we have to look at all possibilities, what we can do. We can first permute these two. So this is the like second two, it's one, two, three, one, three, two. Then we can make this go to two, one, two, and keep the order of the other ones. So two, three. Then we can exchange these two. Um, then we have exhausted everything we can do if one goes to two, and then we can give one goes to three. We can keep the order of the other one, so we have two, three, which goes to one, two, or we can exchange the order of the other ones. And you can easily convince yourself that these are all elements. Maybe it could be. And so how does one, and then this is our, I mean, actually, maybe in, the, <clears throat> in this case, we can see that the group is not commutative. So, so, <clears throat> so we've seen that this is a group because the special case of this group, but it's not commutative. So S3 is not commutative. And we can see this by seeing what happens if we multiply two elements. So for instance, we can look at uh, these two elements, one, two, three, goes to one, three, two. And we multiply it by one, two, three, goes to two, one, three. Yeah. And so what does this give to us? So we have to remember that the operation was composition. So in this case, we have uh, here 1 goes to 2, and then 2 goes to 3. So 1 goes to 3. Here 2 goes to 1, and then 1 goes to itself. And here 3 goes to 3, and then 3 goes to 2. So this is how, what this gives. And we can also do it the other way around. Do the same thing. So 1 goes to 1, and then 1 goes to 2. You can already see it's not commutative. So 2 goes to 3, and then 3 goes to itself. And finally, 3 goes to 2, and then 2 goes to 1. OK, so we see it's not commutative. What? Yeah, yeah, that's true. So you don't, uh, I mean, I like, um, OK. Uh, this way is by uh, analysis and, uh, and calculus. So begin by uh, the function of dark. Well, 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 it doesn't do this. Now that's correct, yeah, but I mean, I, it's not, okay, you know, you have to, some, some books on algebra do this and some don't. I mean, it's not like a, everybody doesn't do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of going against the, so obviously in, in all other fields of mathematics, which is not algebra, one does it in this way. So in algebra, one sometimes also does it the other way around. But, you know, I kind of, I prefer to do it the way, uh, uh, which is kind of general. But, you know, obviously, you know, if you, I mean, if, if the multiplication is defined the other way around, we'll get different results. But it's kind of equivalent. No, it's not a big difference. And, you know, normally the composition of maps is always done in this way, although it is somehow slightly, you know, uh, you know it feels maybe slightly wrong. A lot of books, put, put the argument before the name of the function, not, not f of x, but x, f. Yeah, but this again is only done in group theory and not in any other field. So I mean, somehow I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't like the idea that, uh, I mean, in some sense I, you know, you know, maybe it's uh, for some purposes slightly easier. But I, I think, you know, there's a standard notation in mathematics, and we use that. I mean, it's not uh, even if in group theory uh, sometimes one does it differently. But you know, 
you're free to uh, to do it, do it the other round. What? It's just confusing. You, it's confusing for you, or? Yeah. Well, but the different there's no real big difference, I no. Know. Yeah. So, anyway, otherwise it's confusing for me. I mean, I cannot, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I hope you can manage. No, I mean, it's just, uh, and uh, I mean, in. Yeah. I don't know, in, in the books. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, well, no, okay, no, no, but you're right. It is very often, uh, in, so in group theory you find that, but it's, it's kind of strange. I find it, uh, you know, that there's one small group of mathematicians who does it every, different from everybody else is uh, somehow <laughs> also wrong. So, um, yeah, so if you want, so an exercise could be, I mean, I mean, this is not homework, but I'm just saying if it should be easy to check that if you look at the number of elements, ah, so I'm actually, so I, <coughs> so the number of elements of Sn is equal to n factorial. So for, so n factorial as you, I hope for knows it's just the product of all numbers up to n. Um, so maybe I should say in this context, uh, as this also already came up. So if G is a group, um, the order of G Um, is, um, well, it's just the number of elements of G, so it's just this number. Um, but then one sometimes also denotes it as in a different way. Is uh, odd of G, which is just G, the number of elements of G. So we write um, um, the order of G is infinite, so equal to infinity if G is infinite. So if it's not a finite group, for instance, the integers have this, and so. Here, the claim would be that the order of Sn is n factorial. Well, maybe I don't do this example. <coughs> okay, so one more piece of notation. What time is it actually? So it's kind of useful. Um, have some kind of notation like one uses it for the integers that one can look at powers of elements in the group and things like that. And so we just introduce this. So if G is a group and A an element in the group in the group, then we and we have an integer. So first we want to define uh, A to the N uh, for an integer n in z. This is just supposed to be an element in G. So if n is bigger than 0, so a positive integer, we uh, let a to the n just be the product of n times element a, a times, times a, n times. Okay. Um, if n is equal to 0, a to the 0, we define to be the unit element e. So e is a neutral element. So this is our definition. And um, if n is, say, bigger 0, and we take a to the minus n, so we take a negative power, so if 
obviously n is smaller than 0, we say that a to the n is defined to be the inverse of a to the power n. Uh, well, maybe minus n. Okay, so this uh, defines, gives a, a definition for a to the n for all elements in z, so this is no problem. Uh, and we obviously, in order for this be making any kind of sense, we have to know that kind of the standard rules that you know for you know, the usual numbers when taking power still apply. So this I formulate as an exercise. Um, so show that uh, for any element a, we have a to the so how should I put it? a to the n times a to the m is equal to the a to the n plus m for all n and m integers. And um, if we take a to the minus n, this is the same as a to the minus 1 to the n. Or maybe I wanted the other round. This was a definition, so this is a to the n to the minus 1. Okay. And this is basically, or again, a simple exercise in the definitions. You know how to add and multiply integers, so these are just integers, and then you have to see that you, uh, that this always holds, and this is again for all n and z. So we can write this power kind of notations. Okay, so much for the, you know, the very basic things about groups. Now we want to, um, uh, are there any questions until here? Now we want to introduce uh, subgroups. So these are you know, subgroups, uh, subsets of a group, which, um, you know, if I restrict the group operation of the bigger group to the smaller set, uh, the smaller set becomes also a group. So let's um, do that. So just to make our life a bit easier, I will from now on we will usually uh, denote by one the neutral element of our group. Not always, sometimes we might uh, denote it by 0, or sometimes we might still denote it by e. But uh, whenever I write 1, it will be the neutral element of our group. Um, and in fact, to just say it, so if uh, this we already had, if, uh, our, if g is abelian and we use the additive notation, then I already had said that uh, we still denote the neutral element is 0. No? So here, if you write a plus b for the group operation, then we denote the neutral element as 0. So let's uh, do the subgroup. So, definition well, 
So as I said, it's a subset of a group such that with the operation of the group, it becomes a group itself. So let G be a group. H subset G a subset. So H is a subgroup of G. Um, well, first I just say what I just said. So if um, first for any two elements, A and B, in H, we have that A times B is also an element in H. So here we have the operation in G. And the operation in G has the property that it will send uh, um, and we want that it has a property that if you have two elements in this in this subgroup, uh, their product also lies there. And the second one is that with this operation, H is a group. And with this operation, uh, so with the, the restriction, of a multiplication from G times G to H times H. Uh, H is a group. Uh, well, strictly speaking, it follows from this, no? <laughs> but uh, because uh, we know that the group is non-empty, but obviously I can say uh, uh, in th that it should be a non-empty subset. Okay. What? I think this condition is not known for it to be a subgroup. Which condition? Uh, that for every thing and this is not. No, no. I'm actually asking this. No, I'm making. So in the moment, this is maybe not the, the most useful definition, but it is the most natural definition. You know, a subgroup of a group is a subset which, with the operation of the group, is a group. Of the, of the eminent group is a group. This is the definition. And then, obviously, and that's what I'm saying here. So I'm saying the product of any two elements must be there. And then, if I take this uh, as operation, it is a group. That's a, the, the requirement. So that's a, a definition. But you are right that this is usually not how one states it, because what one usually states is a criterion to be a group. OK, and that uh, I can also write. So we have the following uh, uh, criterion. So um, lemma. Uh, so let G be a group. And uh, H, so a non empty subset H of G is a group, is a subgroup. Well, if uh, we have this property and also another one, so if for all, so if we have that A times B is in H for all A, B in H, and A to the minus 1 is an element in H for all A in H. There's another way of saying I mean, anyway, that we will see. OK, so this is, uh, if you want, often you find this also as a definition. Let's see why this is equivalent. So we have to see that, uh, so the first uh, condition is anyway the same. We have to see that with these con two conditions, H will actually be a group with this operation. So first and uh, conversely. So so 
obviously if H in G is a subgroup, then these two conditions hold. No? Because for a group, we have an operation on the elements in the group. So the product of any two elements lies in the group. And the inverse of any elements also must lie in the group because it's a group. So then, so maybe I write this one and two. So one and two obviously hold. Oh, no. okay. So conversely, well, that's not so difficult. Um, so <clears throat> the first one. Uh, so we now want to show it's a group. So, um, so what do we have to show? I mean, first, so if um, I have L, first, we have we have to show the laws of that it's a group. So if um, for A, B, C in the group G, we have the associative law. So thus it also holds in H because if I have three elements in G, then if I have three elements in H, then they're in, in particular elements in G, and so the associate law holds for them. Thus, it also holds for A, B, C in H. So this is the first axiom. Uh, the second one is we need to have a neutral element. So, So if um, uh, so, let A be element in H. Then it follows that A to the minus one is an element in H by uh, this uh, axiom, and we have that A times A to the minus one is equal to the identity element is equal to A to the minus one times A. And this shows two things. So as a, so, so it follows that as the as a product of two elements in H, one is an element of H. Because uh, this uh, first one here says that the product of any two elements in H lies in H. So <coughs> and uh, H1 is a neutral element of G, so it's also a neutral element of H, because being a neutral element means if I multiply anything by it, it stays unchanged. So it follows that H has a neutral element. And on the other hand, this thing, we also see here that A to the minus 1 is the inverse element of A. No? And A has an inverse. So we see uh, this is a kind of trivial reformulation. I mean, <clears throat> if one wants, one can also, I don't, I never found this particularly useful, but you often find this. It's an easy remark that uh, a non-empty subset um, H subset G is a subgroup um, if uh, we can just write this in some sense in one uh, formula. If uh, A times B to the minus 1 is in H for all A, B in H. So if you want to you can call this exercise. It's easy to see that this is enough to imply this. You can check that. So 
Now let's look at some examples of subgroups. So for instance, so we have um, so Z, so we look at Z together with the addition, so integers with, this, with the standard addition, and so if uh, k is an integer, we can look at, uh, let's say, kz to be the set of all integers which are multiples of k. So this is the set of all n times k where n is an integer. Maybe I should write it uh, in the same order. It doesn't matter as it's commutative. <coughs> um, so these are all integers which are divisible by k. So then I claim this is a subgroup of Z. And I expect you can, I mean, it's kind of clear that, uh, so here we have the additive notation. So um, the neutral element uh, of uh, of z is the element 0, and the element 0 is contained in this. And uh, well, anyway, so we just have to see that the, you know, if you take a product of two integers divisible by k, then if you take a sum of two integers which are both divisible by k, then the sum is also divisible by k. And um, if you take minus an integer which is divisible by k, it's also divisible by k. Okay. So if um, You see, is there anything to write? So if um, a comma b in r divisible by k uh, then so is a plus b and also <coughs> minus a. And so we uh, precisely, now we have here this additive notation term, instead of times we have plus. So of a to the minus 1, we have minus a, but we see that precisely these two things are fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, okay, these are kind of stupid. So maybe if um, each is a subgroup of a group G and L is a subgroup and L is a subgroup of H, then uh, we find that uh, L is also a subgroup of G. And this is trivial from the definition. No, I mean, all from this criterion. And it's also so if. Um, if, uh, say, H and L are subgroups of G, uh, then H intersected L is a subgroup of G. Again, this uh, follows directly definition if or by this criterion. So any, the product of any two elements in H 
lies in H, and the product of any two elements in L lies in H. So if the elements before were both in L and in H, then also a product is both in L and in H. And similarly for the inverse. Anyway, you can check it. If, you are, if it's not obvious to you, it's an exercise. Um, then one very special case of a subgroup. So I don't know which number we're at. Yeah, maybe three. So let G be a group. And uh, A, an element in G. Then we can look at the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A. So let A uh, be the subgroup generated by A. So this is just the set of all powers A to the N, where N lies in Z. So we take any number of products of A, or any number of products of A and A to the minus 1. So note we have this, um, if one remembers this exercise that I formulated about these powers, we know that A to the N times a to the m is equal to a to the n plus m, so which means that the product of any two elements in this a again lies in a. And we know that if we take a to the n to the minus 1, this is the same as a to the minus n. So this says that the inverse of any element here lies in a. So it contains pro all products. here contains inverses. So, um, so this means it's a subgroup. So we have a, for any element, we have a subgroup generated by it. Um, and maybe one can check. It's uh, uh, easy to see that A is abelian, so uh, commutative. And uh, I didn't write it before, but one also says abelian for this for that. A B D N. H may be large. So it's just because, you know, after all the addition in Z is a B N, so A to the M times A to the N will be A to the M plus N, which is the same as A to the N plus M. <coughs> okay, so we get this A B N subgroup of our group. So so we call A is called the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A. So example, we had this already. If we take the group K times Z, this is, after all, the set of all K times N with N in Z. We had it before. So this, as you can see, now we have here the additive notation. So the, instead of looking at these uh, powers, we take the products. So maybe I should, well, OK. So this is the cyclic subgroup of Z generated by K. So maybe I should kind of also, I'm not sure I introduced the notation. So if um, G, if we have the additive notation for the group, so if we write 
um, uh, a plus b for the group operation. Then, as I said, we have we write zero the neutral element, and uh, we write minus a the inverse of a. And we would write for n in z, uh, we write n times a for what uh, otherwise would have been called instead of a to the n. No, this is instead of a times b. This is instead of 1, and this is instead of e to the minus 1. It's just notation. So in, in, then you can see that uh, this, the cyclic, this is the cyclic subgroup generated by k. Um, um, and what time? Yeah, OK. So we will call a group cyclic if it's, uh, it looks like that. So definition, the group G is called cyclic. We write it here prettier. If it is equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by one of its elements. So if there exists an element um, A in G such that A, the subgroup generated by A, is equal to G. So for instance, uh, we see that um, um, Z is cyclic. So for instance, we have it generated. So Z with the addition generated by the element 1. No, any integer can be obtained as n times 1 or some n. Well, that's kind of. And um, we have, if we take this group ZG, ZK, which was just the set of elements uh, 0 to k minus 1 for k positive integer. Um, this is also cyclic, also generated by 1. Of course, by definition, 1 plus 1 is also here equal to 2 and so on until k minus 1, and k minus 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. So let me see. Um, Maybe finally I talk about the subgroup generated by several elements. So definition let G be a group. And uh, say let uh, U a subset, a subset of G. So the, the subgroup um, say U generated by U is a 
what one would call the smallest subgroup of G, which contains U. So technically, this means is the intersection of all subgroups, say H of G, uh, which contain U. So obviously G does contain U, so there are such subgroups, and we can take the intersection of all of them, and we know that intersection of two subgroups is again a subgroup, and it's easy to see that this also holds for the intersection of any number of subgroups. And so we have this, uh, we have this subgroup. This is called the subgroup generated by U. So this is, <coughs> um, so in particular for finitely many elements, if uh, say G1 to G K are some elements of G, we can consider the subgroup generated by them. So this is just, um, I mean, it's denoted maybe like this. And it's just defined to be the subgroup generated by the set of these elements. So this is the sm smallest subgroup of G, which contains uh, G1 to GK. You can check as an exercise, but it's a kind of standard, that if we look, if G is uh, equal to Z with the addition, um, then if I take the subgroup generated by 4 and 6, this is equal to the subgroup generated by 2, which after all is equal to 2 times C. Okay. Hope that's correct. Yes. And you can easily see how you might want to generalize this to any numbers. Okay, okay. so that's maybe enough for, uh, for today. So, I mean, I don't know, you can maybe you didn't make very many comments in between, so I hope it was clear to you. And you can, maybe can, if it's too fast or too slow, you can tell me now. <coughs> um, or if there's anything that is not clear, you can also think until the next time whether you want to ask me some questions. Um, so I think uh, tomorrow we meet early, no? Is that correct? No. What? At four. Sorry. At four. Ah, so that's good, because <laughs> I am actually not... Uh, a very happy early riser. Um, <clears throat> okay, so tomorrow we meet at four, and maybe I will try by tomorrow to have some ex some homeworks, um, which then you have one week to to do. There should be some elementary uh, things uh, to check with these things. So I mean, I hope that you you know that you find what I told you until now quite elementary and kind of easy. Maybe it's a bit faster than usual, but it's things that you normally would already know. And you know, basically, I've given you uh, some simple definitions, and I have given you straightforward applications. Mostly, have a bit many definitions, but you're already familiar with them. You know, with time, obviously, we it will get slightly more advanced, and then you have to, you know, maybe uh, make a bit more effort. But in some sense. Uh, in, we do start from zero, and everything that is being used uh, kind of uh, is explained here. Anyway, okay. Thank you for today.